In this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, I am going to discuss why I believe Kentucky could have four first round picks in next year's draft. So stay tuned to find out the players that I believe could be in the top 30 next June. Big shout out to each and every person that's made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. I'm your host, Rafael Barlow, the director of scouting for NBA Big Board and the founder of NBA Draft Junkies. It is the last week in July. And again, I am deep into the 2024 NBA Draft. I'm going to do a a three-part series. I'm starting off today with Kentucky. But I think there's three teams that could have four players selected in the first round of the 2024 NBA Draft. Kentucky is one, Duke is the other, and the last team is the G League Ignite. So I'm going to profile their rosters and the players that I believe have the potential to be first round picks next June. But before I get started, I wanna let you know that this episode is brought to you by none other than Prize Picks. If you are a first time user, you can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100, but you have to use the promo code locked on. That is L O C K E D O N. That's pricepicks.com, promo code locked on. All right, let's talk about Kentucky. Now, I, I do believe that these three teams that I mentioned Kentucky, Duke, and the G League Ignite I do think if there is a such thing as having too much talent and too many overlapping skill sets, I believe these three teams have it. I mean, there's so many guys on this team that have NBA talent. It's going to be a, a tough job for Coach Calipari and John Shire and, and, and Jason Hart to, to make it mix because with the game being so positionless now, a lot of guys have just versatility there's not guys that are just only ones twos threes fours and fives there's a lot of guys that can play multiple positions and and i feel like in in the situation with these classes they have a lot of guys whose skill sets overlap and then you know are if if some guys are behind and and they don't feel like they're one and done are they going to be patient to stay another year So anyway, it's going to be an interesting dynamic that I'm going to be following and charting all season long. But I want to talk about Kentucky. Now, the 2011 class, which had Anthony Davis, Michael Kidd Gilchrist, um, I think Marcus Teague was in that class. But anyway, in 2012, Kentucky had four players selected in the first round, which was Davis, Kidd Gilchrist, Terrence Jones and Marcus Teague. And then they also had two more players that were drafted. So they had six players drafted overall in 2012. Four in the first round. I think this year's Kentucky team could possibly have four guys selected in the first round. Maybe even six overall. All right, so so let's just get into it. According to 247 Sports, their composite high school rankings for 2023, Justin Edwards was number three. DJ Wagner was the number six recruit, and Aaron Bradshaw was the number four recruit. Now, DJ Wagner and Aaron Bradshaw played on the same high school team. And then this year's class also had Rob Dillingham, who was number 16. You had Reed Shepard, the son of Jeff Shepard, who I think he was the most outstanding player in one of Kentucky's national championships. I don't know if it was 96 or 98. So he's a legend in the state. And then you had Jordan Burks, who committed to Ole Miss, was kind of like a late addition. Um, He was ranked number 142. I think he's going to be a possible NBA player down the line. I don't know if he's a one and done. So anyway, you have six guys, six guys that were in the top 200. But in, in reality, you have five guys that were ranked in the top 50 recruits. Then add on the fact that you have Antonio Reeves coming back, and then you got Trey Mitchell. So I get into that. All right, let's talk about Justin Edwards. Justin Edwards, I think, has a really, really, really good chance to be the number one pick overall. I like what he brings to the table. He's six eight. I think he can shoot, and he can fill up the box, the box score. He does a little bit of everything. Um, and the Global Jam, which is a a, a Global Jam, it, it's a tournament 
where I think it's like an under 23 tournament that's played in Toronto. And last year, Team USA was represented by Baylor and Keontae George had a big performance. This year, Team USA is represented by Kentucky and Justin Edwards averaged 14 points per game in that tournament. Got off to a slow start and I think he scored just four points in his first game, but in the last game he scored 23 and he showed why scouts are so high on him. And in the last few games, the last four games, I believe, he averaged 14 points, six rebounds, three assists, 1.5 steals, and just show what he's capable of. But the, the slow start kind of balanced his numbers out where he only shot 30% from the floor. But he was only 7 for 24 from the floor in the first two games, but he was 15 of 31 in the final two. He was arguably the best player in the 2022 EYBL circuit where he averaged 19 points a game, shot 55% from the floor. I talked about Justin as a potential number one pick in the episode last week. So he would, in my opinion, if I were betting man, he would be the first Kentucky player to be off the board in next year's draft. I talked to a scout. I have an article coming out on NBA Big Board. He felt like... Justin is a top five pick. He didn't think he could go number one, but this this is a the same scout that was extremely low on Brandon Miller last year, and I had talked to him about um, what he got wrong about Brandon Miller, and and is he using that same concept to be a little bit lower on Justin Edwards? One, Justin Edwards' age, he is. I guess you could say he's the same age as some of the guys in last year's and this year's draft. So he's a little bit older for a freshman. And and the scout mentioned, like, yeah, he sees a lot of similarities. But you know, he's he's honest and he's saying like as far as like aesthetics, Brandon Miller and Justin Edwards aren't guys that are basically aesthetically pleasing to him, so he has a tendency to rate them a little bit lower. But he did feel like if Justin Edwards can shoot the ball like Brandon Miller did last year, then he has a chance to be the number one pick, which, you know, there isn't a Victor Wimbayama in, in, in the 2024 draft. So Justin Edwards has a chance, but he's a big wing that can defend multiple positions. And people are a little bit divided on his athleticism. Some th think he's a, a good athlete. Some think he's an okay athlete. There have been times where I watched his film and I said, oh, he struggles taken off on one foot then there's times where i see a play where it just makes me question why they even put that where he shows his athleticism but edwards is he's in the mode of your your big versatile wing that nba teams covet and one of the reasons why brandon miller went so high in the draft now the second player that has a chance to crack the top five for kentucky is dj wagner now we all know dj wagner as the son of dewan wagner Three, I mean, I guess he's a, a third generation McDonald's All-American, one of the most hyped players in this class. And it seems like the, the buzz that he had as the number one player in this class, I want to say for like maybe his first couple years, it seems like it's kind of went back a little bit, but he's, he ended up being one of the, the top five recruits. Now, my concerns about Wagner is I think that he's a scorer. He's, he's a combo guard. I don't know if he's necessarily a point guard. He can definitely get buckets. I love the fact that he always plays aggressive. He's always in attack mode, always, you know, just getting to his spots. And he's, he's relentless. Like, you're not going to get a night off as a defender if you're guarding Wagner because he's going to put the pressure on you. And in the global games, he was actually fourth on the team in scoring, which is a surprise to some. A lot of people would have thought he would be first or second. But he was fourth on the team in scoring, averaged 14 points per game. But he averaged 4.7 assists, which, which I thought was really good for him. And he averaged three rebounds a game. Only shot 42% from the floor and 33% from three. But I thought he showed some flashes as, as being a capable playmaker. And I think Kentucky is going to have an interesting dilemma because they have two guards in, in Wagner and Dillingham who I think are more so like scoring combo guards than natural point guards. So I wonder is that going to have an impact on on their team as far as just like winning and then 
as, as far as just like helping these guys maximize their draft potential. All right, when we return, I want to talk about Aaron Bradshaw. I'm a little bit higher on Aaron Bradshaw than the consensus. I've been watching different mock drafts and I've seen him all over the place. But I spoke to somebody who said that they believe Aaron Bradshaw has a chance to be the number one pick in this draft. And I thought that was a little bit of a reach. But hear me out why I think that there is a possibility. But let's talk about Prize Picks. Prize Picks is today's sponsor. And with Prize Picks, it's basically daily fantasy made easy. All you have to do is pick two to six players and you decide if they will score more or less than their Prize Picks projections. And you can win up to 25 times your money on any entry. There's no competing against other people. It is just you versus the projections available. And Prize Picks offers projections on any sport you watch, whether it's NBA, NFL, NHL, Major League Baseball, college football, men's college basketball, women's college basketball. They even have esports and cricket and, and, and Eurobasket and MMA. So check it out, and your entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that easy, it is safe, and you can get your money out fast. And it's currently operational in 30 states and our neighbors to the north in Canada. So all you have to do is download the Prize Picks app or go to prizepicks.com, sign up, and you can play daily fantasy sports. If you are a first time user, you can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100, but you have to use the promo code locked on. How it works is if you deposit 100 bucks, Prize Picks will give you 100 bucks. If you deposit 50, Prize Picks will give you 50. So do not forget to enter the promo code locked on at sign up for instant deposit match up to $100. Once again, big shout out and thank you to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. And in the next episode, it'll be part two of this series I'm doing about the teams that I think can have up to four guys selected in the first round. And in the next episode, I will cover the prospects on Duke's 2023-24 college basketball season or Duke's team for the 2023-24 college basketball season. Duke's team is loaded but a lot of overlapping skill sets so it'll be something to uh, check out if you are interested in finding out which teams can have the most prospects in next year's draft. All right I want to talk about Aaron Bradshaw. Aaron Bradshaw is a player that I think is a little underrated. Now he was highly touted, a little underrated. I think if he puts it all together, he does have a chance to be the best player on Kentucky's team. Now, fortunately, he just underwent foot surgery, so he missed the Global Jam. I don't know how long he'll be out. It's 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 unclear, but I would say a couple months. But based off of what I've been hearing, he should be available for the season opener. Now what's interesting about Bradshaw is he's 7-1 and he wants to play the four and not the five. And I, I'll get into the player that I think is gonna be their starting five. Bradshaw is, he's a little skinny, but when I watch his film, he is skilled. I think he has upside as a shooter. He shows good shooting touch. He should be able to knock down threes. He's athletic, a good rim protector. He's thin, he's going to have to bulk up and get stronger and unfortunately, with the foot injury, I think he's going to be a little bit behind his teammates as far as just the conditioning. And we saw how that impacted um, Derek Whitehead last year and even Derek Lively for Duke and, and even Cam Whitmore a little bit. They missed some time in the preseason. But Bradshaw is a, an interesting prospect because he's he could be your your floor spacing, vertical lob threat, and rim protector. Now, if the rumors are true that he has reportedly asked to play the four, then I think that, um, I don't think that's gonna be his NBA position. I think he's a five. I do not wanna see him play the four and just be primarily used as a floor spacer. I would love to see him used as, you know, like a rim runner vertical lap there, but if they're gonna run this too big lineup, it could be interesting. But here's a quote from John Calipari about Aaron Bradshaw and the guy that is, I think, is gonna be the five is Yugana Oyenso. All right, this is what Calipari says. He says, we may be able to play two seven-footers at one time because they're both skilled. They both can shoot. They can shoot 15-footers. One can shoot threes. The, the one is Bradshaw. So you have two seven-footers that if you choose, you can play them together. 
Now again, if it's true that Bradshaw prefers to play the four, which then again, John Calipari has the power to be like, no, you're playing the five. But if he prefers to play the four and they play both of them together, he's gonna have to shoot the ball well or Kentucky's gonna have some spacing issues. But Bradshaw is, again, a seven-footer that can rebound, block shots. Again, he, he's going to need to get stronger. I think he has good touch around the rim. He's athletic. He's, he's, he's mobile. I think unless something clearly goes wrong, I think he is a lock to be a first-round pick. All right, last. The last guy that I think has a chance to be a first-round pick, or, or I would say has the best chance to be a first-round pick, is Antonio Reeves. And Antonio Reeves had a very, very interesting summer i'm surprised he's back at kentucky i had heard that he wasn't coming back that he was leaving um, he did enter the nba draft and then there were rumors that he was not coming back i even heard that he enrolled at illinois state which is his former school during the summer but antonio reeves averaged 14 points per game last year shot 40 percent from three most of the year he was the sec co six man of the year was a big time scorer at Illinois State. And last year during the summer, when Kentucky went on a tour, he was their best player. He put up big scoring numbers and it translated to, to the season average 14 a game. But for whatever reasons, he put his name in the draft, decided to come back, decided that he didn't know if he, well, he didn't know if he was gonna go back. Um, from what I hear, he missed the window to enter the transfer portal. And that's probably played a big role while he's back. But during the Global Jam, he was Kentucky's best player. He averaged 23 points per game and like really under 29 minutes per game. He shot 58% from the floor, 56% from three. He was 18 of 32 on three-pointers. He was their best player. I think they're really going to need his shooting this year. And I think that even though he's not necessarily the flavor of the month because he's not a freshman and he's had multiple years of college basketball experience. I do think there may be a team in the back end of the first round that may value his outside shooting and his scoring punch and believe that he can help them. So I wouldn't be surprised if Antonio Reeves is a first round pick in 2024 NBA draft. All right. When we return, I want to talk about some of the wild cards, the guys that I believe have a chance to be first round picks in next year's draft, but I think can be drafted overall. Stay tuned. All right, last segment. I want to talk about Rob Dillingham. Now, I've been on record as saying Rob Dillingham is one of my favorite players to watch in the world from an excitement point of view. He's box office. He's shifty he is i mean just exudes confidence like i've said that about plenty of prospects before but he takes it to another level his confidence and his ability to break his man down and and, and just use his crafty and creative handle and quick first step i mean he's exciting to watch but the problem is and this is just my opinion i don't think kentucky was the best fit for him i think that he needs total total freedom and I, i've read that calipari is going to give him some freedom but he needs total freedom i think he may have been better off at a school where he would have had the keys he's not going to have the keys at kentucky he is someone that if he has a strong freshman year i wouldn't be too surprised by it but if he has an absolutely disaster of a freshman season that wouldn't catch me off guard either. Just because I think he, he, he's super talented and gifted as a scorer and, and, and ball handler and, and his offensive creativity and his mind is, is, is incredible. But the shot selection is a major work in progress. Major work in progress. I mean, we're talking about a guy that only shot 33% from the floor playing for overtime elite. Now, one thing about overtime elite and I wrote about it on NBABigBoard.com. If you're not subscribed, please check it out, NBABigBoard.com. It is my newsletter. I wrote about overtime has, at least in my opinion, maybe changed a little bit of the narrative against them. The Thompson Twins played well in the Summer League. You had Jalen Martin for the Knicks played well, earned a two-way contract. He's a guy that nobody was talking about in the draft cycle. Don Barlow 
played well for the Spurs when he got minutes last year. I think he had like 21 points and 19 rebounds or 19 points and 21 rebounds in the last game of the year. Again, it was the very last game of the NBA season against the Dallas Mavericks that were tanking. But at the minimum, he showed he is an NBA player despite the fact that he wasn't undrafted. And I think it's because a lot of people just didn't know what to think about OTE in their first year. Um, the Thompson Twins, and I mean, they brought a lot of attention to it this past season and their success in the summer league, along with, um, like I said, Jalen Martin and Jazian Gortman, who's just signed an Exhibit 10 deal. I think it might've showed that there are some good players in overtime and, and maybe we underestimated how we underestimated the talent in OTE. So I said all that to say this. Rob Dillingham is someone, and maybe he's a little bit further along than, than we thought. And maybe he's not. It's still, I mean, there's still some questions about OTE. Uh, I think that OTE helped prepare him for like the professional aspect of it, even though he's he's in college, he's a college freshman. I, I still think that he's a little bit prepared more than someone who just took the high school route. But anyway, how he plays is going to be one of the things that I'm going to monitor and check out all season long because in Canada at the Global Jam, he only averaged five points per game, only shot 31% from the floor and 14% from three. I think it's a long shot. I think that he might be a, a two-year guy, but you never know. Injuries happen, and I'm not hoping that happens, but you just never know in college basketball. He may get an opportunity, and there may be a team that is really intrigued with his upside as a shot creator and shot maker, but I think he's definitely going to have to show that he can be efficient. All right, another player that I actually think has a chance to be a first round pick if he dominates on the defensive end is Ugana Oyenso. Now he is another player that entered the transfer portal but decided to return. If I'm not mistaken, I, I, I thought he entered like right after the NCAA tournament. And, you know, the rumors are he wanted to earn more playing time and he wanted to capitalize on his NIL money. Now, I think that he is extremely raw on offense. I think that he's really raw. He shows some flashes, but overall, his just movement looks like he's new to the game of basketball, which I think he fairly is. But defensively, it's where he can make an impact. He's actually on the Nigerian national team. He was the youngest player to ever play on the Nigerian national team at 17 years old. He was a four-star recruit in the class of 22. And I've heard he's gained weight. I heard he's up about 12 pounds since he entered campus. And last year, he only played seven minutes per game. Average two points, two rebounds, but one block. One block in seven minutes. So he was... I guess you can say he was productive in the minutes he played, but when you watch the film, you see a lot of it was in the early season when Kentucky was blowing teams out. But anyway, I think he has a chance because he could be a rim running, shot blocking big that can serve as your vertical lob threat, has a 7'5 wingspan, and it's just known as a, a rim protector and a defender. He's mobile. Again, he can run the floor. I, I wouldn't say he's the most fluid, but I do think with his length, mobility, and athleticism, there could be some teams that are interested in taking a chance on him. Now, fortunately, he's out. He got injured, I think it was their first practice, or anyway, it was a practice before going to Canada to play in a global jam. So, unfortunately, he's out. I've read that he's gonna be out for two months with a, with a foot injury. And so, um, it'll be interesting just to see what happens with him. But here's a quote from Calipari. He says, at the end of the day, my gut is he'll be the best big, if not one of the best big guys in the country next year. Now, is that a salesman pitch? Is that, you know, a, a, a quote because he, he thought he lost him? I don't know. I mean, I do think that there is a possibility, especially on the defensive end, but I think he's just a long ways away on the offensive end, a long ways away. I think his touch around the rim, is a work in progress. Even though he's added some strength, I think that's gonna be an issue. But again, there's a chance that he could be a first round pick. All right, next player I wanna talk about is Reed Shepard. Reed Shepard is the son of Jeff Shepard. 
and he was Kentucky's Mr. Basketball and one of the most hyped recruits to come out of the state of Kentucky in years. Now I thought he opened some eyes in Canada at the Global Gym. He averaged eight points per game, but he averaged six assists per game, 5.8 to be exact, but eight points, 5.8 assists, 1.7 steals and two rebounds. So I, I thought he played really well. Um, really well. I know he had a big game against one of the teams. I can't remember what the team was, but I think he's more so of a two or three year guy. But you never know. If he shoots to cover off the ball and, and, and shows that he's a connective tissue, then, then maybe he could be someone that is drafted. And then there's Trey Mitchell. Trey Mitchell is a very well traveled prospect. Trey Mitchell is 6'9, he went to West Virginia last year and then he transferred to Kentucky after the whole Bob Huggins saga but he's on his fourth school he went to UMass he went to Texas then he went to West Virginia I first started scouting him or evaluating him after he left UMass and transferred to Texas didn't play much there went to West Virginia now he's at his fourth school but in the global jam he was very impressive and it's going to be a dilemma when the, the two bigs, Bradshaw and Oyentsu are healthy, what happens with Trey Mitchell? Because he averaged 14 points, eight rebounds, and four and a half assists for Kentucky at the Global Jam. Again, the Global Jam is an NCAA competition, but the way that he played showed that he can play like this small ball five that can space the floor. Now he is 6'9", so Kentucky was a little bit undersized, but he's more, advanced offensively than they're too big. So Kentucky has a really good three big rotation and they looked good with him at the five, but keeping all of those guys happy as far as with their NBA draft stock is going to be a challenge. But I mean, when you go to Kentucky, you know you're supposed to sacrifice and Calipari has done a good job of making guys sacrifice. And it has been to the detriment of their draft stock for a lot of guys. I mean, I've talked about it at length. You see, Multiple years where a Kentucky guy outplays his draft position is because he did so much sacrificing when he was at Kentucky. But anyway, that wraps up this episode. I broke down all the players on Kentucky's roster. Actually, there's one more guy that I, I didn't cover, but I'm sure to be talking about him in future drafts, but I think he's more so of a 2025 guy. But anyway, that wraps up this episode. Again, Kentucky has an opportunity to have four players selected in the first round, maybe six overall. And I just gave you a breakdown of the guys. And in tomorrow's episode, I'm going to break down, I'm going to give the same breakdown on the players on Duke. And while I think Tyrese Proctor is underrated, I think Tyrese Proctor is a top 10 pick. And then later on this week, I'll do the same for the G League Ignite. Once again, it's Rafael Barlow, and I am 